Thanks, everyone, for coming to our panel today. Um, I'm Julian Barnes. Um, I uh, want to remind everyone that uh, you can submit questions, and we'll take a few of them uh, at the end of our panel. You can use the uh, RNDF app. Uh, and those viewing across the country can uh, submit their questions via Twitter with the hashtag RNDF. Um, we have an interesting panel with a topic today that uh, can take us in some interesting directions. We're going to discuss uh, what President Trump's strategy and policy mean for the defense industry. We're going to discuss what it takes uh, to keep America first in the world of uh, military might and technology. Um, in the tradition of this forum, we're in the legacy of a president who knew how to reach across the aisle. We're going to keep this bipartisan. Um, I'm going to have everyone uh, open with a brief two-minute riff on, on the question of what America First means for the defense industry or defense policy from their perspective at the Pentagon, Capitol Hill, or corporate America. First, I'm going to introduce our panel, and then I'm going to let them take a crack at this question. Um, first, we have uh, uh, the uh, majority leader, uh, Rep. Kevin McCarthy of California, first elected to Congress in 2006. He's going to enlighten us about what's really going on in Capitol <laughs> Hill. Um, uh, we then have the Honorable Ellen Lord, Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, Technology, and Logistics. She previously served in a variety of top jobs at Textron. Um, we have General David Goldveen, the uh, Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Uh, who had, <laughs> oh my god, oh, I've screwed up already. Well, guess what? I can't make another worse mistake for the rest of this panel, so now I'm good. Hua. <laughs> okay, so let me start again. Uh, General David Goldfein, the Chief of Staff of the United States Army Air Corps. Only getting functionally better there. No. So, General Goldfein, as you all know, and I clearly don't, um, is uh, had not only is he the Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, but has had uh, uh, a variety of senior jobs, Director of the Joint Staff, the top Air Force Commander in the Middle East, a storied career as a, as a pilot. Um, we have uh, Wes Bush, the uh, Chairman, President, and CEO of Northrop Grumman, one of America's biggest defense companies, uh, the maker of... Uh, the uh, venerable A-10 and the futuristic uh, B-21. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Mr. Mike McNamara, the CEO of Flex, 200,000 employees uh, working on uh, supply chains and logistics for companies of all sizes. Um, so I want to start here with uh, the majority leader to talk to us about what he sees as uh, what America first means for the defense industry. First of all, thank you very much for having me. And I'm glad to have the Air Force with us. So. Um, what does America first mean? There are so many people that would interpret that in their own manner and what they want. What it means is we put American interests and people above everything else. So that means the protection of the homeland and abroad. That also means if there's a risk somewhere in the world, we do something about it instead of letting it grow. It also means if you're putting American people interests first, you want to enrich the world to become freer. So the character of your country should reflect what you're propelling out in policy as well. So you should be stronger to your allies. You should strengthen your allies in a number of manners, the things they have to carry out. But you should approach those that, that are trying to make the world not as free. That doesn't mean America has to be the police everywhere, but the character of who we are, of what we should lead, is different than any other nation. And I have this found belief really based upon what Abraham Lincoln said in the Gettysburg Address. We all know it, force born seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth in a new nation. Conceived in liberty and dedicated the proposition that all men are created equal. It goes on to say, but if we fail government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish the most. We are different than any other nation before us. And you know when it hit home the hardest for me? Shimon Peres, 
at 91 when he's still alive and still president of Israel. He's sitting in the rotunda of the United States of America. He's looking out behind, about of all of us. We're giving him a medal. And he looks to us not being an American, but saying, you live in the greatest nation that's ever been on the face of the earth. Not the greatest nation in his lifetime, but in the face of the earth. He goes, you know what your greatness comes from? Not what America will take, but what America will give. That America will give the ultimate sacrifice of their own life for freedom. And with that, freedom becomes human rights. To me, that's the definition of American faith. Thank you. Ms. Lord. Thank you, Jillian, and thank you to the Reagan Defense Forum for having us all here today and to all of my colleagues up here. America first, to me, that means our national security, and I look at that through the lens of Secretary Mattis at the Department of Defense. And one of the things that makes Secretary Mattis such a fantastic leader is that he's very, very clear in his vision and how we're going to go about achieving that. Three lines of effort we talk about in the Department of Defense. First is lethality. We need to win on the battlefield, and we have significant overmatched challenges today. So it's incumbent upon all of us, um, Congress, to help us with sequestration, which has probably done more to harm the warfighter today than any of our adversaries, to industry to invest um, to make sure we really do have cutting edge technology. Second line of effort is building partnerships and allies. America first doesn't mean America alone. It means we go to war with our partners and allies, a true distinction and differentiator against our adversaries. But there are many ways to go to war, and one of them is being interoperable. So what does that mean to us at the Department of Defense, and what does it mean to industry? It means we need to make the foreign military sales process easier, faster, much simpler and less costly for our partners and allies. A lot of work we can do there. And then finally, the third line of effort that Secretary Mattis has is reforming the way the Department of Defense does business. Now, having been in industry for 33 years and being incredibly surprised to get a call to come and work at the Pentagon, um, I have some pretty strong perspectives on what could be done differently, as does the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Patrick Shanahan. So we are working on many reforms from the very simple things like you have a meeting and you take actions with people who are responsible for those actions and dates by which they will be done, um, to the really trickier parts of deciding that it truly is a partnership with Congress and we're going to go up to the Hill and we're going to sit down and roll our sleeves up and talk about what's challenging and what we need to do together. So America first to me means taking these three lines of effort and working closely with industry, with Congress, and making sure we truly have the most lethal war fighters in the world. Thanks. General. Thanks. I can't wait to tell General Mark Milley that I've just taken over his job. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be there. My buddy <laughs> and my neighbor. Uh, I think of the panel members, uh, I would offer that uh, I see myself as the, op I'm the options guy. My job is to build options for the Secretary of Defense, the National Security Leadership, the Commander in Chief, to be able to prosecute and win our nation's battles. And I've come to look at this job as a Chief of the Service through three, ha three hats, and each of, one, each of those hats gives me an insight into uh, how I'd approach industry partners mm -hmm. in terms of how we organize, train, equip, and present ready forces. The first hat is the most traditional, which is a service chief that's responsible for building capacity and capability to fight and win. I think from an Air Force perspective, the nation expects that uh, first and foremost that we are going to sustain and maintain a secure and reliable nuclear deterrent side by side with our United States Navy. And I think that the nation expects an airman, when they see this uniform, to own the ultimate high ground, which is air and space superiority, neither of which are American birthrights. They've got to be planned for, resourced, fought for, and won. And they expect us to maintain pressure on violent extremists. And so through my organized training and equipment and present ready forces hat, I look at the America first in terms of what options I can present 
to be able to accomplish those missions. The second hat is my Joint Chief hat, because I do represent, uh, and, it's, and it's a unique, perhaps, time in our history. Um, all of the Joint Chiefs, we grew up together and we fought together. And we all fought together under this guy named General Jim Mattis. So we have this, build, this trust and confidence that we built that you build in combat. Uh, and so we're working together to look at not just what is better, best for the United States Air Force, but what's best for the joint team. And I've got to look at it through the lens that I, I, I have yet to find a mission that we perform as a joint team that doesn't require an airman to be involved in that mission. Whether you want to talk about protected communications, whether you want to talk about the position navigation and timing that, you know, that, that airmen are working on right now for the planet in terms of GPS. So I've got to look at the lens of being a joint chief and ensuring that we're moving the joint force forward in line with what the Secretary has laid out for us. And the third hat is an international air chief and representing our international partners. And what I've found and the reality is that nations around the world face the same challenges politically that we do when we talk about boots on the ground. And unless they have access to ports, they generally don't buy navies. So what, what most nations around the world that may join or be part of a coalition have to offer first is an air component. So as an international air chief, I have a, a responsibility to be working not only with the Department of Defense, but also the Department of State about how do we build partner capacity and how do we sustain and maintain coalitions. So from America first as a strategy, I see myself as the options guy. What options can I give the commander in chief and how do I articulate that in terms of the risk associated with utilizing those options? Mr. Bush. Okay, thanks, Mr. Chairman. So I look at uh, this question through the lens of the defense industrial base and our ability to do our job, which is to ensure absolute technological superiority for the warfighter. At the end of the day, that's why we exist. And if you ask most of the folks who work in our uh, defense community, they'll tell you that's what our job is. So as I think about all of the discussions that we're having across our defense community, I am a bit concerned that I too often hear almost an acceptance that the pace of technological change, the globalization of technology will inevitably result in the US not having absolute technological superiority. I don't accept that. And I don't think that we as a defense community should accept it because that outcome, in my view, would be a choice. It is not a destiny. So as we think about the things that we all need to be doing to ensure that we can continue to have that technological superiority, that we can continue to provide our extraordinary men and women in, in uniform that decisive advantage, I think we have a lot of things going for us already. And, and it's important to remember what our assets are uh, to make sure that we can continue to invest in those assets. We have an innovation ecosystem in the US and with many of our allies it really is second to none. The ability of business to work together with government and with higher education is exceptional. The human capital that we have today in our industry and in our government and in higher education that commits to this focus is exceptional. And in fact, what we have is the model that many others are attempting to emulate. But yet at the same time, we have a number of very significant issues and we need to be clear-eyed about what they are and we need to be determined to address them so that we don't slip into this mode of allowing this advantage to decay. And when I think about those challenges, there are several of them that I think uh, this morning, hopefully we'll have a chance to touch on a few. Uh, clearly investment, and we've all talked about that. Uh, we uh, have a lot of focus on the very detrimental impacts of the sequester. And uh, I, I would commend a particular study to you if you haven't seen it. I don't know if Andrew Hunter is here from CSIS. But uh, Andrew has just put out a study that actually attempts to quantify what is happening within the defense industrial base as a result of the sequester. And it's a little bit of a depressing study. Sorry, Andrew, hate to characterize your study that way. Uh, the only thing I found of any satisfaction is in reading it was, we told you so. But that's not very satisfying for any of us. Uh, it is clear that the sequester has had very significant negative effects across the defense industrial base, not only in its impact on R&D investments, but also in terms of the demand signal that it has sent to the supply chains. 
Uh, the larger companies, to a very large extent, have been able to soak this up a bit, and, and I commend uh, the companies in our industry that have maintained their commitment to R&D, but it is difficult in the supply chain, <clears throat> and this study does a good job of depicting how challenging that has been. A second issue that I know we are working on together, but it is a barrier we can create for ourselves, and we need to make sure that we address this aggressively, is this whole issue of our own speed and our own risk tolerance and our ability to take this fast changing set of technologies and really get them into the hands of the warfighter and quite frankly, the rate of adoption amongst our warfighters of these new and advanced technologies. These two are areas we need to make sure that we're aggressively focusing and driving this capacity as much as we can. Last but not least, while I feel great about the workforce we have in our industry today, and I feel honored every day to have the opportunity to work with the teams across our industry, we all see what is happening very quickly. Uh, we all know the, uh, the tough demographic curve that we are facing in our industry and the need to bring a lot of new talent in, develop that talent, enable them to carry this forward. Because when we're talking about technological superiority, we're not talking about some mystical forms of intellectual property or just the assets that we all invest in to enable it. We're talking about the people. People are what create technological superiority for our nation. And making sure that we're really going to be at the front for the future means making sure that we are developing uh, the workforce and bringing that workforce into our industry. We have some profound challenges there. There too, we need to be clear-eyed about it, work together to address it. Mr. McNamara. Yeah, uh, just a little context. Um, most people don't know us. We're not heavily into the defense and uh, aerospace industry, um, if you will. Um, but we are manufacturers. We have 200,000 people around the world. We manufacture all kinds of things. You, you guys use a Xerox machine. We build all the Xerox machines. Xerox doesn't build Xerox machines. We build the HP printers. We do the Ford Sync. We do 40% of the blood glucose meters that are sold in the United States. So we don't have our own brand, but we have a brand that actually we actually build for others. And when I think about America First, I, I think very much about jobs. And that's a cornerstone of the president's policy and particularly around America's First is bringing, bringing jobs to America. We have a, a unique opportunity to actually help and enable that. So I, I look at it as an extraordinary opportunity. We're in 14 different states with operations. We have millions and millions of square feet and we're generic manufacturing capacity, which means anybody who wants to build in the United States, we actually have capacity available in multiple regions and multiple locations where we can immediately bring and enable companies to, to bring uh, product to be manufactured quickly, reliably, um, in a system that's already set up and, and developed. So we look at it as, a, as an extraordinary opportunity. Um, we're the largest electronics manufacturer in the United States. So when it comes to actually enabling companies, particularly in technology, to actually come into the United States, whether it's automotive or medical or, or telecom or datacom or connected home or any of the new technologies, um, we have this capacity that's available to bring in. So we would love the idea of America First and love the opportunity to encourage and enable um, any company in the world to move into the United States and um, offer them opportunities to scale. I, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Um, uh, Majority Leader, uh, we heard uh, from Mr. Bush about, he mentioned the word sequester. The first panel talked about continuing resolutions. Uh, are we, I want you to talk a little bit about whether we are fated for uh, continuing resolutions at all time. In general, I wondered if you could weigh in and say um, if this sort of current dynamic continues uh, in how budgets are done, does that impact uh, your ability to, uh, uh, how does that impact your ability to have an Air Force that's uh, ready to fight and ready to provide forces? First of all, I want to give a lot of credit to Chairman Mac Thornberry. You have to win the argument before you can win the vote. If you watch the transformation inside the House, we make policy in the world of politics. Both effects, sometimes some way over the others. But he's been able to transform the House, if you watch what the NDAA did, and you watch the funding of where it's going, 
to really start the correction of where we've been in the past. We know the damage of sequestration, but we're not the Congress of five years ago of watching it down here. We're about to come up and out of it. No one in Congress likes a continuing resolution if you're the party in power, because all you're doing is funding old policies. If it's the military, you can't invest in something new, and you're investing in something that you don't want to continue on. You don't have the flexibility. In a world of where new technology matters, you don't have the ability to make those changes when the world's changing so fast. I'll give you one example how fast this world changes. 2010 was the year Republicans took the majority. You know how many cars Uber had in 2010? Three. Now they're valued more than Ford, Honda, or GM. I cannot tell you there will not be another CR, because there will be another CR next week. But this is the difference. It will be a two-week CR, so we can stop having CRs for the future. The only reason we're going into a two-week CR because we're in negotiations on the caps. Now, I want to take the politics out. I want to make the policy in. But when you sit with both parties, one says it has to be equal a dollar for military and a dollar for domestic. You should fund your military with what you need to accomplish to protect you from the threats. That's what you should decide the number upon. And that's the argument of where we're going. So we could actually, getting a short-term CR, be able to get a cap agreement that would allow us to finish out appropriations. And let me give you one other difference, because so much you hear a negative from Washington. We did all 12 appropriations bills this year in the House. You want to know the last time a Republican majority did that? The iPhone wasn't invented. <laughs> we have produced more bills than any other Congress in modern history in the first term of the presidency. So we're changing the structure, but you won't see the light for a little while. But if we're able to put that pressure get the agreement, not only this year, but you'll have next year as well. And we'll get out of this mess, hopefully once and for all, and be able to make the decisions much more on policy than on politics. General, do you want to weigh in? or? Uh, well, uh, we actually haven't completely recovered from the last sequester. So here's what happens when, when, when you're required to find $10 billion in a single year. You stop flying. All, all squadrons who are not either preparing for or executing combat operations stop flying. You cease all civilian hiring. That's just two examples. When you stop flying, it affects far more than those who strap the aircraft on. It affects air traffic controllers, weapons loaders, fuelers, all the thousands of hands that touch an aircraft before it gets airborne. All of those qualifications go away. We're flying aircraft. Our civilian workforce and our depots are magicians. When you see civilian hiring, you don't see civilian retiring. You just lose the workforce. Same challenge that, that you have. If we don't get past sequester in its current form, the United States Air Force, and I speak now for all the services, we will have to find $15 billion in a single year. We sometimes talk about no-fly zones. You want to see a no-fly zone? Go find any base that's not either preparing for or executing combat operations. You will see no more flying. What keeps me up at night is that this smaller force that's executing combat operations, contingency operations globally, is stretched. And there's not a lot of tension left. And my concern is if we don't get beyond sequester in its current form, we're going to potentially break this force. And we're going to break the force because the, the concern, and it goes back to your point, which is this is not actually about the technology. This is about the people. And if they don't feel like, I mean, when a pilot doesn't fly, when a maintainer doesn't maintain, when an air traffic controller doesn't control for some period of time, they question our commitment to them. They've committed to us to defend this nation they start questioning our commitment to them. And my concern is um, they're going to walk. And that is going to be a capital investment loss for the nation in terms of our readiness that is going to take years to recover. Uh, Ms. Lord, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about where you view uh, 
the American military technological edge. How successful was the previous administration's a third offset push from your perspective? What do we need to go here? And then I wonder if anyone else could weigh in on whether you feel the American position in military technology, could it really be challenged by China or Russia? So I think um, DEPSEC, former DEPSEC DEF work had great vision to lay out the third offset because basically what he said is we have near peer adversaries and we have to change, augment what we're doing to meet that threat. We've been dealing with violent extremist organizations for quite some time. So there was a lot of groundwork put in place to look at how you get into that non-permissive airspace where our weapons, our aircraft can be seen and taken down. And although a lot of the work is classified that is being done, there is a significant amount of work being done. I'll pick one area that the department is funding and also industry is putting money into that's very significant is hypersonics. We are generating capability. There are programs at DARPA. There are programs within OSD where we are generating new weapons that fly differently, that fly very fast, that I think are going to be significant in our ability to really have an advantage over adversaries. And if the prior administration hadn't had that foresight and laid out the vision, I don't think we'd be where we are today. Anyone else want to weigh in on this? Uh... I would just say I think it is clear to all of us who have the ability to see what is being done now in other countries, uh, both in terms of the um, mass, if you will, that's being applied to attempt to catch up, as well as the capabilities that are beginning to emerge from that effort. We've got our work cut out for us, no doubt about it. And while it's difficult sometimes to communicate that to the American public, because of the classified nature of that understanding, I think it's important for our defense community to be clear. We don't want to be seen as being overly alarmist. That's never helpful. But I think we need to be as factual as we can about the challenges that we see coming right at us because of this determination on the part of other nations who may be our competitors or they may turn out to be our adversaries. Mm -hmm. And we need to have that clarity and use that clarity to help motivate our actions. I think you know, that I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was to say, if I could just follow up, I think this also means that we need to continue the dialogue with Congress because the world's shifting around us and sometimes we need to redirect some of our investments. And that's a tough thing to do sometimes when you have to say what I decided I was gonna do three years ago that was in the best interest of our nation perhaps isn't now and it's always hard to stop something, but we are having very difficult conversations about we need to stop some things and start some others. And when we're in this environment where we can't get the new money, as you That's mentioned. why a CR is so damaging. It is, it is. It is. But I, I will say um, I think that there's a lot of effort going on um, amongst the entire community to try to have that conversation because it's hard. And I think it's hard for <clears throat> Congress to go back to their constituents and say, guess what, we're going to stop this right now even though it's in your district type. Mr. McNamara. Yeah, the, you know, again, we're a more distributed manufacturer, so we have over a billion dollars of revenue in like 12 different industries. So, so our perspective on innovation and development is really broadly based, but what we can see is that the amount of innovation coming out of some countries, um, particularly in China, is extraordinary. So they are moving very rapidly from a copy um, and what they would call learn um, to pure innovation. So the, and they actually have more advanced digital technologies than a lot of what we have in the United States. So as a result of that learning, the amount of engineers that are graduating, the amount of um, work they've done in terms of educating companies abroad and bringing them back, they're absolutely moving to an innovation society. So if I think about product categories, whether they be servers or data centers or, or AI, um, you know, the technologies that you see in high-speed trains and all that and sophisticated um, systems, it's actually going at a much more rapid rate than, than I, I think than anybody really imagines. And you probably see it, I probably see it more just because I see the consumer industries first because they have the cycles of learning that are only a year. But one of the benefits we have in our company is you can actually see 
consumer innovations and how they think because it actually responds to the people and the application then as it moves into automotive and into medical and to all the things. But the advancement that they have in terms of digital technologies and actually they've crossed the chasm and they are now innovators. So, and the speed at which they work with and get funding with the government is also a very significant um, uh, benefit for them. So I wouldn't underestimate as we think about staying relevant um, technology wise, I wouldn't esti underestimate how much um, challenge there's gonna be in the future and how rapidly it's moving. Mr. McNamara, I want to ask you, um, America First uh, can be interpreted as a protectionist or nationalistic uh, policy. You work with a global supply chain. If there is the perception or the reality that America First is a protectionist uh, policy, how does that affect your business? And, and maybe Mr. Bush would weigh in afterwards. Yeah, like I said, I think it's um, obviously the agenda of the president's jobs. Um, as much as anything, and, and I think we're in a unique position to help that out, so we view that valuable. The one thing we have to recognize, whether it's, whether it's that policy or whether it's you know, what Congress is doing now in certain terms of setting tax policy, is whether we like it or not, the world's supply chain is a global supply chain. And we actually have to be careful that we don't um, create policies that are one stop fits all. I mean, in other words, the electronic supply chain a lot of those component technologies are in Asia, and they are not moving. I mean, you can put taxes on them, but they're, a lot of them are not gonna move. Um, so what it does for us, and, and how I think about it is, is as work gets redistributed, that's partly our job, um, and, and I'm okay with it. We just have to make sure we're balancing it in the America's First agenda with sensible policies so that they actually create actionable moves. Some supply chains can't move, and if you just tax them, then you'll just get inflation. And that's not good for the American people. We actually have to have policies that actually can tax things potentially that actually can move. But if your core underlying component supply base is moved and it's not practical to bring it back, then we, we just have to embrace this global supply chain. So. So I, I will tell you, having spent a fair amount of time in the security communities of our allies, the message that I'm hearing on America First is actually very positive. And it goes back to what Kevin was saying. If America First means American leadership, they're all in. That's what they're looking to us for. They need our leadership, particularly when it comes to these security matters. They want America to be the first ally that they turn to. And they see this as a great opportunity. So I, I think that is a, a positive construct that we can all build upon in terms of the way that we're interacting with our allies. Majority leader. I just want to follow up on what you said is right. Um, don't misinterpret American first with what the president's saying. The president's not opposed to trade. He's looking at a, a fair trade in the process. And I think he's making some improvements. The modernization of NAFTA is positive in that, in that aspect. But you, you raise a good point about making sure our tax code, because structure dictates behavior. But for too long, we've something manufactured on the outside, but we began to see, because of our tax code, those things manufactured in America leaving and domiciling somewhere else just based upon our tax code. Now, one of the things I was most excited about on the day we announced tax reform, and I know we were here last night, also noticed the Senate actually did pass it, which is a very good sign. Um, Broadcom announced they're coming back to America. That's $20 billion a year, $6 billion in manufacturing every year, and another $3 billion in R&D, where they started in America, left based upon the tax code, and now, with this new policy, and the other aspect of it, let's all admit, the regulatory world, the changes that we've seen there, I think that's a bigger strength that we'll find, but it's true when we walk through this tax policy, we have to make sure that everything is not exactly alike. And if there are some areas you don't get right, you make corrections. Mm -hmm. In order to keep America's technological edge, should industry be doing more, taking more risks in terms of bringing prototypes, new projects to uh, the Air Force, to the Pentagon, and what needs to change in terms of Pentagon policies to make that happen? Uh, I'm gonna start with you, General. I think the, the nature of the dialogue that we're having with industry has changed. 
and it's changed because uh, we've, we're, we're coming out of what I would describe as wars of attrition, and we're entering into wars of cognition. And so what the dialogue I would have had in a war of attrition would be, how many can you build, what can it do, and how fast can you get it to me? In the wars of cognition, I'm asking different questions. I'm asking, does it connect? Good. Does it share? Better. Does it learn? Bingo. And so we've got to approach the business of, of <clears throat> what we procure and move beyond the traditional sensors, weapons, and platform discussion to the business of networks and connectivity. Because all the services are talking about the fact that we're too small for what the nation is asking us to do. And that's an accurate statement. But if there's not the resources to grow, then we've got to think about how we can do better with what we have, which means we've got to connect what we have in new ways. I mean, I liken it to the, you know, the Rubik's Cube, right? If you think about all the colors on the, on the cube as different military capabilities, hmm. our job is to figure out in the wars of cognition, how can I see and understand more than the adversary? How can I decide faster than the adversary? And how can I act quicker to provide multiple dilemmas in a way that would overwhelm an adversary? And if it causes a competitor to choose not to become an adversary, then I've actually achieved deterrence in the 21st century. So I think we're in a different dialogue with industry in terms of what it is that we're interested. And I will tell you, for me as a Chief Staff of the Air Force, that's the questions I'm asking. I'm really interested if I can get a yes, yes, yes to does it connect, does it share, and does it learn? Anyone else want to weigh in on that? I think I'll just make a comment <clears throat> that, that the way we fight now, where there's not as many lines between the different services, means that everything has to talk to one another, all these different systems. So that's driving us to rethink how we think of everything we're procuring and is making us reflect on what are the architectures, what are the standards. We can't have a whole series of different data links if you're going to have um, a tank on the ground connected with um, some aircraft in the sky. So we have to step back and fundamentally think about the global battlefield and set up an architecture and build to that, which means, again, we're going to have to stop some things and start others. Additionally, when we're in a very constrained environment, we have to look at what we have fielded and how we can take and rearrange and repurpose that. And really, a lot of that comes down to software. So how can we take all of these different hardware components and use a little bit of software to recombine them, to speak to one another, to have maybe some machine learning, some artificial intelligence. And really with just a small incremental investment in the broad scheme, get a real st step function change in capability. So I think that's where we're thinking about all of this and it's doing things differently and it's not how we've done it before, which is going to mean that we have to go to some non-traditional players to, f to figure out how this is done in the commercial realm. So we've learned how to do that in small ways in the Pentagon. DIUX has done some great things. SCO has done some great things. We have unbelievable performance from some of our rapid capabilities offices. But what we have to do is figure out how to scale that. There's an, there's an element in the NDA that people may not have looked at. Will Hurd had this modernizing government. We spend $80 billion a year on IT and 80% of that goes to a legacy. Because the structure doesn't allow you to make that other investment. Mac Thornberry put it in, amazing, because what you'll do is you'll give the incentive to invest in the other. And so far when we looked at government in the past, the innovation came from the investment in our military. Now today, things are moving so fast, it's the outside world that is moving faster. That's where we have to be able to have that synergy where we can connect together faster. Yeah. We're yeah, the, Mr. McLaren. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, if a product comes to us, you know, and I'm from Silicon Valley, I probably see new, more new products than like any company in the world. Everything, you know, what you said, General, about connect, share, and learn, you know, I, I call it kind of the system of intelligence. Um, 
every product needs hardware, software, it needs to connect with sensors, it needs hardware, software, data, it needs an analytics, and your ultimate objective is to get, be, get to predictive and cognitive, and, and you know, that's really based on the back of an artificial intelligence. But the real payday is the new data that you're now getting by having all these sensors and everything in the field that you're now creating actionable insights off of, and that's where real learning comes in place. And it, anything, everything we see coming through, it doesn't matter if it's the coffee cup, literally, or the wash machine, or any product that's coming in, is coming in with this full stack, this system of intelligent solution. And I think that world is just moving so fast, and a lot of consumer technologies apply in automotive technologies, and they just go across. Sometimes you need a partner to get to hardware, software, content, data analytics. You can't necessarily do everything yourself. So your ability to form partnerships and to leverage off of um, other companies that are non-typical, maybe defense companies, yeah. to actually solve a defense problem is like critical in the future. You can't do everything yourself in this it's much more complicated world. So I want to ask another question about this realm of artificial intelligence, wars of cognition. Uh, this may be an area that the US does not have a clear uh, lead over China or maybe even Russia. Uh, and most importantly, when implying those technologies, it may be that Russia or China are willing to use artificial and intelligence uh, uh, autonomous systems in a way that the United States or another Western democracy is not. Uh, the United States wants to keep a human in the loop. Maybe China won't care. Um, how do we, if this is the fu future battlefield, how do we keep an edge there in this environment? Ms. Lord. Yeah, I think there are some very fundamental things before you get to the actual weapon systems themselves. Just like we need to become interoperable on the battlefield, within the Pentagon right now, we have incredible data that we don't always turn into um, really information and knowledge. And part of the reason is because all of this data is in different places. We have lots of what I'd call silos of excellence. So we are not leveraging everything even within one service or across the services. So a fundamental shift we're making is to move um, the entire DOD to the cloud so our data can be shared and leveraged and we can do big data analytics, we can do artificial intelligence. But this is, again, a question of scale. We right now have a number of different clouds, but we are no kidding right now writing um, the contracts to get everything moved to one cloud to begin with and then go from there. So a lot of the things we wanna do technologically, unfortunately, we're a little bit held back by the transactional side, which doesn't sound nearly as exciting, but we've gotta get that right. And that's where we are right now. And that will allow us to do some of the things we're talking about where in the commercial world, all the data's there and you can mine it mm -hmm. and use it mm -hmm. and get more out of it. Right now, um, General Goldfein doesn't have all of his Air Force data in one place. He can't drive that to the tactical edge to have his UAVs really leverage everything else that's going on in the Air Force. Yeah, I'll make one other last comment too, just to, uh, on the back of that, Ellen. Um, you know, while we can talk a lot about this stack and, and about product development and how the products need to be smart and connected and all that, if you don't evolve your management systems at the same rate in this world, then you're still gonna be left behind. So you have to simultaneously migrate and, and change how you do your product development and to take advantage of the system of intelligence, but simultaneously you have to evolve your management systems. And I always talk about- But, but the, the AI question goes to the heart of who we are. We cannot let this go to another country. We continue to lead rule of law and innovation. We just heard where China is now no longer a copier, they're an innovator. We've listened to Putin say, whoever, whoever controls AI controls the world just a couple months ago. We have Silicon Valley and the ability of technology continue to move, but it's fundamental difference because we believe in freedoms, and when you have freedoms, government does not move as fast. But this is where we have to have the discussion. Mm -hmm. And it's almost to, if you take it to a lower level autonomous car. So if I drive my car, 
and I roll through my stop sign and a car almost hits me, it changes my behavior, but it never changed my wife or my children's behavior. But when an autonomous car does, it changes every other car. And to be honest, when you look at the workforce and others, there's more than millions of truck drivers, but there won't be a truck driver a decade from now. We have to, as a nation, though, look to not let others get ahead of us. You keep the rule of law, but you keep innovation. That's what keeps us ahead. All these other things we're talking about, the synergy of doing it, yes, but we as policymakers have to make that investment. We can protect the freedoms, but we have to look to the future at the same time. And AI is the intelligence of being able to move forward. And we've watched through the military the capability of doing it from the drones and others. We were the first and others would follow. We need to stay ahead, and this is what makes me nervous, the movement of China and Russia, and that's where as policymakers, we need to make our investment and as well. This gets down, I just can't help myself, I have to make this point. Yeah. Um, this gets into a challenge we have as DOD going back and working with Congress where we say we have to experiment, we've got a prototype, and we can't tell you exactly what we're gonna do with that money. And there, because we don't know, because we're experimenting. We should not be afraid to fail in these either. Absolutely. You and learn from them. At this, as long as we're learning from them, I have no problem. Absolutely. So when we say we're going to do these types of things in the next six months or a year, we can't tell you exactly what we're going to do because we need to do that first experiment. That's a tough conversation, getting comfortable with some unknowns. But in here. today's world, the more data you have, you don't have to test for as long. You don't have to do as much. I mean... If we just changed how we kept our laws for our own medical history, we wouldn't have to have so many medical tests. We could solve things faster. We need to tech, protect our individual freedoms, but we also have to look at a changing world where we can actually stay in front and keep innovation at the same time. General, can I hear from you on, on this idea of artificial intelligence? Might we lose a uh, hyper war with uh, China? I think we've got to move beyond. I find myself in times in, in what I would call 20th century discussions that are uh, characterized by platform v. platform discussions. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, how does the F-35 do against the J-20? And I say it's an almost irrelevant discussion because I can't think of a scenario where I'm going to put a single F-35 against anybody. When you face the United States of America, you're going to face an F-35 plus low Earth orbiting satellites plus an Aegis cruiser plus a brigade combat team plus a Marine Expeditionary Force, plus, plus, plus. And, and the key is, how do you connect them? And how do you connect them in ways that allow the commander-in-chief and commanders that are per trying to produce options to be able to create options at a pace that the adversary can't keep up with? The only way you do that is through connecting to make sure that they're sharing, and it also makes sure that that those uh, men and women who are actually doing some of the analysis are only looking at that which is of interest because artificial intelligence and other capabilities has filtered out that which we don't need to look at. Right now, we're doing a lot of very manpower intensive analysis at looking at, and that, that has got to be funneled into, into looking at just what we need to in order to be able to get to decision speed. And so if we can go down that path, and start looking at far more beyond platforms, weapons, sensors, into the connective tissue of military capabilities, then our ability to stay ahead of the adversary is not as big a concern. If we stay in platform-centric discussions, I think it's a real concern. Everything becomes a node. That's right. This goes back to the earlier discussion, though, around culture in our community, and our, our not just tolerance, but our incentivizing speed and the right degree of risk taking. And I appreciated your perspective on the increasing dialogue with industry. We see it. It's a necessary uh, starting point to enable us to get to the ability to invest appropriately to support the demonstrations, the prototyping, and to enable us to actually bring the intellectual capital and engage it in a way where we can move a lot faster, which is exactly what we're going to need to do so that we don't find ourselves in a position of being behind in areas like machine learning and artificial intelligence. 
There has uh, been some mentioning of this uh, concept that America first does not mean uh, America alone and that we need our allies. I, I wonder if we could weigh in on a couple things here. One, do we think that uh, allies have the sort of technological investments to keep up and to remain uh, interoperable with the United States? And, you know, as Europe starts talking about strategic autonomy and initiates its own sort of efforts at group spending, is there any w worry that American companies will be uh, frozen out of that, especially if America First is interpreted in a more protectionist uh, way? Uh, Ms. Lloyd. I spend a bit of my time overseas, and I would say we are very, very tightly tied with many countries. If you look at what we're doing with NATO, there's a huge discussion about everybody getting to at least 2% um, of their GDP for investments and then taking 20% of that 2% and putting it towards major platforms or R&D. And they, when you sit there in Brussels and you're at the Council of National Armaments Directors, the different countries look to the U.S. to see what we're going to say and what we think, and they follow and they will participate if we lead. And I think there's a very, very healthy dialogue about how we work together, how we can invest intelligently in Europe especially. You have countries coming together to do um, buys together to leverage you know, economic scale, and then looking to train with us and work with us. So. I think um, that there is a lot of investment and a lot of focus. We still outpace everyone, but the innovation is incredible. I was just in Israel a couple weeks ago. Now, we fund a lot of that, but the innovation there is amazing and went through a series of classified presentations where, frankly, they're outpacing us, but they're sharing with us, and we'll benefit from that, and that's the way it should be. We should have healthy dialogues. Mr. Bush? So I think one of our challenges is to continue what we've started, but to really get it over the top, which is to change our perspective on how we protect technologies. The export control regimes that we've had for so many years, despite the changes of the last few years, are still rooted in a Cold War mentality. And that mentality was, we have all the best stuff, we're gonna draw a big moat around it, and we're gonna make sure it doesn't go anywhere which makes it really hard for other nations to feel comfortable at all in partnering with us on technology because they're concerned that it'll land here and never get out. So as we think about these sets of changes we need to make, I really would encourage uh, pushing forward faster on the way that we're looking at things like uh, ITAR and, and our other processes. It's clear there are some of our technologies we're not gonna let get out. And I actually think the framework that uh, Secretary Gates uh, illuminated a number of years ago where we build higher walls around fewer things is exactly the right way to think about it. But we need to be intentional in this partnering at the technology level with our allies because they are making some really good investments. And as Ellen said, uh, we can see in, in a number of our allied nations some innovations that we really need to leverage here. So we need to make it easier to do that. Yeah. And I'll tell you, many of us who spend a bit of time in the Middle East, we see how our policies in terms of constraining exports over the last five years have meant that Russia and China are now the partners of choice, which is an obviously huge issue. I will say this administration is committed to changing that. The partnership between Secretary Madison, uh, Mattis and um, Tillotson at State and Ross at um, Commerce. There's a dialogue there, and it's a healthy dialogue, and I'm confident that we're going to make some very good changes there. Majority, oh, General. Go ahead. I offer one uh, thought. We're coming out of 16 years of conflict in, uh, in a way that we have actually had control to a large extent of the rheostat of time and warfare. We've been up against a very resilient adversary in the Middle East, but think about it. We actually announced several months prior to going back into Mosul exactly what we were doing and where, and there wasn't much the adversary could do about it. Yeah. That's a luxury that we will probably not enjoy in the next conflict against a peer adversary. When you believe that you have the control of the rheostat of time, it actually allows you to bring uh, partners in and out of the coalition at a pace that you think you can control. That's a muscle that we've got to build a little stronger, I believe, because the next 
The next fight may not allow us that luxury. And we're gonna, so when I talk about connect, share, learn, and I say share, that's sharing not only within the joint team, but that's just as importantly sharing with our allies and partners. Because when the war starts, we're gonna need them there with us on day one. We're not gonna have the luxury of going to build those allies and partnerships over time. Majority Leader, how do we uh, share technology with our allies and partners uh, more effectively, but also more effectively protect our technology from uh, countries like China or Russia that are trying to uh, steal it? If we're afraid China is gonna steal it because we're gonna sell it to an ally, it's already been stolen. The protection from China is protecting our own ability for them to enter our businesses today, which they've already been doing. The greatest threat, theft of anything has been China's theft over the last couple decades. And it's not just them now as well. North Korea, Iran, everywhere else. This is as, as we move more to co connecting it everywhere else, you've got in the cloud, you've got to be able to protect it. It does give you greater protection, but technology is going to be ever changing. And you're always going to have to be on protection, but that's why our laws will have to change where we can communicate with one another, too. If somebody's being attacked, it's like everybody else is being attacked, but you're not warning them on how to fix it. You, you were correct. The reason why some of our allies have turned to Russia and China is because it's too difficult to buy something from us, and the world's changing and becoming more dangerous. So it goes against what we're even saying American first. We want our allies to do more. They want to be able to purchase more. We're saying no, and then we're upset with them and saying we're going to pull out, and we're letting somebody else fill the void. I think it goes to back to what Wes Bush said. Build higher walls about small things, but allow some freedom to go, because the one thing I've always found in the sharing, you build a stronger. And if they're, if they're wanting to purchase, they're wanting to purchase out of fear of attack from somewhere else. And if you're their friend, and if we're asking to move it up to 2%, I think you can use that incentive. If you're investing higher, you get a higher ability of what you buy. And if I treat my allies fairly, they're going to be closer allies in the long term. I think there's a way to do this smarter than we have been doing it in the past. This is not the question. All right, so now I have the iPad, so I can go to some of the, the uh, <laughs> questions from the uh, audience, so uh, sorry about that. Um, here, uh, General Goldfein, uh, given the recent tragedies following accidents with the Navy's Pacific Fleet, what measures are you uh, taking to counteract stretching for the Air Force? So uh, I think for all the services, you know, we are all focused on where are, where are our gaps? You know, we have. We have this muscle that has actually been built up uh, in the business of fighting violent extremists in the Middle East. And we have, I mean, we built an entire ISR industry in many ways from MQ1s to MQ9s to the analytics that go about it to the networks that we go after. I mean, that muscle is, is strong. There are areas where in the peer competitive business, in a China-Russia scenario, a North Korea scenario, we all know that there's some of those muscles that have atrophied. And so where all the services are doing are looking at where it is that we need to balance our training to ensure that we can continue to put pressure on violent extremists, but that we also can prepare the force for what may be coming next. And, you know, as an obligation as a service chief, you know, I have very few that are, that I, I look at this one as a moral obligation, that no airman is sent down range that's not properly organized, trained, equipped, and prepared, and led to be able to accomplish the mission that we extend them to do, and that we take care of the families while they're gone. And so making sure that we have the balance right, I think is where you're seeing all the service chiefs focus right now as we make sure that both these muscles are equally strong. Ms. Lord, did you want to weigh in at all in terms of what DOD needs to do to make sure it's not doing too much and is doing the right things? I think it's making choices like we're all talking about. We've got to stop doing some things, and we have to sometimes get Congress's um, agreement to stop doing some of these things that might be unpopular back at home. But I think everyone's juggling a tough situation. Every, we have to make choices about 
where we're flying, where we're sailing, where we're putting soldiers on the ground, where we have Marines. And these are tough decisions. Um, and I think we make them every day. And when we have uncertainty with funding, it makes it much harder. Majority Leader, um, what do you think about this general issue about whether we have asked the, the military to do too much and that that has uh, uh, caused a stretching problem. How, but it's very difficult, as we heard in the first panel, to make, for Congress to make the hard choices of, of what the military, uh, direct the military to do to work with the, the administration. What do you think? Is there any possibility of asking the military to, to do less? To How can you balance those sort of resource issues to make sure that they have enough to do their mission, but they're also not asked to do too much? Well, it's a combination. I mean, I, I think when you look at what's happened in the past, it's a combination of actions. Some could be sequester, a more dangerous world, and we're really asking our men and women to do, make greater sacrifice and not as an entire nation helping in that process. Most things that happen, though, when there's an accident, it comes back to human error when you find it. If you trash that back, did we have enough training? Did we push them to the element where they are out and they're not coming back enough to prepare for the next? And I think a lot of that is happening in the Navy. We're asking them to go places and for a longer period without coming back with the rest and the training and before. Um, what I look for Congress should do, we should look at what the world's threat is. We stand in the library of a man who taught us best to be prepared so you never have to use it, to be stronger so no one ever would challenge you that. And I think from that perspective, we have to look at where the world's at today and where the world could be tomorrow, make the investment that we need today, but also make sure that our men and women are best prepared with any of that time to come. But also, as a nation, we have to have this discussion. After 9-11, we were so united as a nation that we would have made the ultimate sacrifice almost anywhere. But I almost felt like we were told to go back to the shopping centers. And then those in the military, time and again, went the extra mile. And we wanted to show them that we can get back to the American life. I think collectively, we all have to be in together. And then things will be shorter. And the sacrifice will be, fewer, be less on a fewer. And if everybody shares in that sacrifice, I think we'll achieve our goals faster. Ms. Lord, you mentioned uh, Israel and your, your visit there. Uh, it's a country that's done well uh, working with its uh, private sector, non-traditional defense companies to take technology in and, and bring it into its defense world. That's something that has been discussed at previous Reagan defense forums, this, this great know-how that the United States has in Silicon Valley and the difficulties in bringing in that off-the-shelf technology and putting it in a military context. Uh, how are we doing at improving that situation? What are the, the next goals in that realm? Well, I think that's part of what all of the reform effort um, within the building is about. And I think at small scale, we're doing a very nice job of it. Um, groups like the IUX that I mentioned previously, they have 60 some contracts out there now with small sort of non-traditional defense suppliers really bringing innovative technology in. They also have been able to get their workforce to embrace some of the less used authorities that Congress has given us, like OTAs, other transaction authorities. And frankly, Congress has given us many, many authorities. We haven't done the job that we can do in terms of training the acquisition workforce to be able to use those. So I think we're doing things on a small level. Our challenge is to scale that. And that's what our reform efforts are about. That's why we're looking at putting more of the risk um, within AT&L and the research and engineering side, really have a focus on modernizing what we have for technology, prototyping, experimenting, iterating very quickly 
quickly, um, be not afraid to make mistakes, and then look at the acquisition and sustainment side to be very agile and be able to move, as Secretary Mattis would say, at the speed of relevancy. So right now we're working on flow charts for our acquisition workforce that if you are doing something that's relatively simple, relatively inexpensive, you should not use the same process that you use for an aircraft carrier or an F-35. Um, we intuitively know that, but we haven't uh, made it easy for the acquisition workforce to do that. And frankly, we haven't trained them very well. So we have to take a fundamental relook at what we're doing at the Defense Acquisition University. We have a lot of opportunity, and we're rolling up our sleeves and doing it. Mr. McNamara, as, as somebody who's at a non-defense uh, company, does it feel like DOD is uh, open to uh, uh, this part of American business. And, you know, what do you see opportunity in terms of the kind of digitized supply chains that you work with uh, that the Pentagon could benefit from? Yeah. Yeah, we've got um, some experience working with the uh, Department of Defense and some other um, agencies. We see a lot of how they do it elsewhere, particularly in Israel. Um, but I think the, the key thing is, I mean, what Ellen just said just now is like perfect. You know, we have to, uh, you know, be willing to, to explore, to in, investigate, to put out some contracts and learn. Um, you have to be ready to fail um, is really, really important. A, a key innovation learning for me and for the world really is, is um, you actually have to be able to, to take risk and, and learn. And it's okay to pivot and change. And a lot of times people stand behind um, th their process and stand behind their decision, and a lot of times that's not the right thing to do. So I think what Ellen just said is, is a great you know, step to go move forward. I think there are massive amounts of learnings in private industry that we can apply across to the defense industry. And a lot of those learnings are in just like supply chain innovation. It actually doesn't matter what part you're moving from point A to point B. But we have this company, or we have a relationship with this company called Elementum, where the whole point of it is to get multi-company um, visibility so that you can have much more supply chain precision and much more supply chain velocity. And that actually changes a lot of how you now can manage. So I think just as you have to innovate in products, um, you have to do the same level of innovation around the systems and processes by which you manage your system. And also, I would interject, getting back to what um, General Goldfein was saying about taking care of the people, I'm not sure that we've had the most innovative approach to human capital within the Pentagon. And we haven't done nearly as much, from what I can see, in terms of rotating people, moving them around in assignments, moving them in and out um, from industry, from academia. And the bureaucracy is somewhat daunting to get that done, but we're tackling it because we need to really adopt more of the model that DARPA, for instance, has. They've done a phenomenal job of people don't come to DARPA forever. They come there for three to six years. That way you get the freshest thinking, you get all that experience that is out there in the commercial workplace. And we've got to get more innovative in our thinking about not only how we contract, but also how we deal with the people side of things. I, I often tell people I came in August to the Pentagon and coming in from industry, I was used to having your HR person on one side and your finance person on the other side. I couldn't find either of those people when I went to the Pentagon. It just isn't structured that way. There are a lot of people that know check, finance, check, check, and there are a lot of personnel check. people, I have a mic but there wasn't a strategic look. Don't have any reverb. Part of, so part we of have it, too, is if you have streamlined yes. processes, less bureaucracy, more decision-making, more decisiveness, you're more likely to get engagement from <laughs> private industry. Because one of the big risks in private one. industry, now you're, now you're but of course, but... Um, one, in private check, industry check, is like, man, yet. if I go start one, two, doing two, a program two, with the government, it's going to be like a year and two, a half before I get a PO. Two, two, and two, you sit two, there and go, wow, check, is that check, the best check, use You're killing me. We're not going to be like that. That's not <laughs> the way. Time. We're going to talk. I'm not saying. <laughs> but part of getting all the best one, two, ideas two, two, out of check, private check, industry check, is actually having a process that enables them to engage and actually make a meaningful contribution. And then if they make a meaningful contribution, they get revenue. So it kind of works together. There's a great story check. about That's Ben enough. Rich, who was the CEO yeah. of Stoke check, Works, check. came to the Pentagon. He sat down with Secretary of Defense Perry and the Chief Staff of the Air Force and a few others, and he pulled a marble out of his pocket, and he rolled it across the conference check. room table. And as the story goes, the Secretary said, what's that? He said, 
That's the radar return of the back of the building. So we have the moral of that story is that that actually works. It's up to us connecting and talking and communicating and allowing that dialogue. And, you know, that's frankly why it's great to be here this weekend. We're having some of that, you know, outside of these formal settings. Uh, Mr. Bush, there, there are those who argue we've had an America first policy for a long while in the defense industry, and that's created a lot of good manufacturing jobs in America, uh, jobs that, that drive local economies and really uh, keep communities alive. Um, as we go forward and as manufacturing becomes more and more automated, will we still have the sort of economic benefit uh, to America from uh, defense industry manufacturing? I absolutely believe we will. It will be like all of the transitions that we've gone through and other technologies over the course of time. The jobs will be different. There will be a lot of jobs, but they will be different. And so, from an industry standpoint, one of the things that we are having to focus on already, this isn't some future scenario, this is already happening. We're having to focus on how we educate our workforce, how we transition our workforce from the skills that they were trained in coming into our business to the skill sets that they will need as we go forward. And it's not only the work we're doing with our current workforce, it's also the work that we're doing with higher education. And one thing that I see happening in our country that I think is fabulous is the receptivity amongst both community colleges and four-year universities to working with industry to change curriculum. That has to happen more extensively across our country so that we can generate the workforce skills that we're going to need for these new capabilities, these new technologies. So there's a lot of uh, fear-mongering that's going on out there, and it, you know, sometimes it starts with the AI discussion or others. <laughs> We've been through this before. We have to manage these transitions. There are going to be great jobs. They're just going to be different. That leads to one of the audience questions we have here are, you know, are we doing enough to create a, a workforce that has a STEM expertise, has that science technology background? What does industry need to do more? What does the government need to do more? Uh, we're, we're living through the fourth industrial revolution. And none of us in this room have ever lived through an industrial revolution. And it's happening faster than you ever envision. Politically, when you have disruption and somebody loses a job because of the change in that, there's two things you attack, trade and immigration. They're really not causing it. It's the revolution itself. Now, if we acknowledge that and make our policymakers, and then also from the aspect outside, one of the best ways, if you want to see change in government, don't think the same people that are sitting in government are going to change it. The last bill that, oh, that President Obama signed, he signed 20 minutes in the Capitol before he walked out until he was no longer president. It happened to be my bill. It was a talent act. Mm -hmm. Why can't we grab these people from Silicon Valley and let them come to government for a short period of time? They have a whole mindset of how the private sector works and speed and technology and others. Give us two years, and then you can go back. Put the, because they're just as patriotic. They want to provide, but they can't continue. That contribution will help us speed it up, educate internally, but we also have to look forward just like that truck driver. If it's not going to be there, how do we transfer them in to what's building new inside your business and others? I think those discussions we need to have, and from a policy point of view, what are the parameters that we have to change to let that flow happen? That's exactly it, because I'm living this right now, trying to do this very thing, and I think we have some unintended consequences of the barriers we put on people, both getting people in um, so that they can get in the seat, and then the constraints on them when they get outside of government. Um, so that's something that's really ripe for discussion. The barriers are huge to entry and exit, and I think it's overly constrained. And I think what Kevin just said about the Industrial Revolution is exactly correct. I mean, your, your comments, Kevin, or, or sorry, Congressman, 
Uh, I like Kevin better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the polling goes higher when you call me by that. <laughs> but who's counting? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Kevin. <laughs> um, I think those comments are exactly correct. I mean, finding policies and ways to embrace new technologies to, to bring them in. People are patriotic. You actually yes. have to find ways to engage them. Um, there's new ways of thinking, and, and having the right systems and processes to be able to engage is like really important. So, and, and I couldn't agree more with your comments about the Industrial Revolution. We, we are in, We're in a the middle structurally, of fundamentally different time. We are almost at the end of our time. We have 30 seconds left, so I'm going to give the last word on our panel to the uh, Army Air Corps Command. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in this discussion, I would just say, let's be clear-eyed about what continuing resolutions does to our industry partners and how it affects me as a service chief. When I go to Northrop and say, I don't know how many munitions I'm gonna buy next year or the next year, mm -hmm. and would you please keep this very sophisticated workforce with all of its weapons, you know, its security clearances engaged, and oh, by the way, I'm not gonna be able to bring you the money until the last half of every year. Um, that's a real concern for me. So today we face an interesting challenge. We have time to prepare, but no money. Um, we don't know how much time we have, but we, now, we have from now until then to get ready. If in fact we engage in peer conflict, we will have money, but no time. Because if history repeats, um, we will get the resources we need to go, but we're gonna be out of time. So the question for us now is, what are those things that we can do to minimize the regrets between the Department of Defense and industry to ensure if that day comes that we're ready? Because, and I'll end on this, uh, make no mistake, when the call comes, we go. Mm -hmm. Ready or not. That's an important point to end on. Please join me in thanking our panel members. Enjoy the rest of the forum. <laughs>